I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. Now, our next movie is not in the same league. It's Murder by Decree, yet another Sherlock Holmes film. Why so many Sherlock Holmes films? Well, as the cost of making films gets higher and higher, film companies seem to be playing it safer and safer with remakes, sequels, tried and true subjects like Sherlock Holmes and Dracula, films that don't take many risks, films that don't take any risks. Murder by Decree is a quite violent film. In fact, it's so bloody, I think it should really be rated R instead of PG. In that picture, Christopher Plummer plays Sherlock Holmes. Late in the film, he confronts England's prime minister, played by John Gilgood, with evidence that a series of killings of low-rent prostitutes leads right up to the throne of England for its prime suspect. In the circumstances, I shall ignore your offensive attitude. If I seem to be offensive, Prime Minister, you may take it I am offended. You offend me. Can I resign? Would that satisfy you? Yes, resign. And there we see really the film's biggest problem. At a crucial point, its ending, Murder by Decree, is much too talky. That speech goes on for at least another five minutes. <laughs> it ends up ruining what could have been a fine picture. It does have some good performances. Christopher Plummer is a good Holmes. James Mason is excellent as Dr. Watson. But the film's long, talky passages really obliterate all the thrills. You know, Gene, you're right. I was thinking there can't have ever been that many thrillers that suddenly, at the end of an hour and a half of action and so <laughs> forth, stabbings and burnings, and you're right, it's very violent, suddenly we get, you said five minutes, I'd say at least ten minutes of inexplicable mm. dialogue. They recapitulate what happens. Holmes speculates about the meaning of it all. It's not elementary at all this time to Holmes. The audience sits there, they're stunned. It's going on and on. What did they do? Tune into a radio play? Yeah. Well, you've devastated this picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm amazed, I guess, uh, that it does build up like that and then really come to a halt. Do you think it should have been R-rated? I did. I th Perhaps so. Yeah, it's a pretty bloody picture for a PG. It's not a family Sherlock Holmes yeah, movie. Yeah, I would not sure. take uh, my kids to the film. And in fact, I wish I didn't have to go myself. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but you did. And now Roger begins with a film that just earned Jack Lemmon his seventh Academy Award nomination, Tribute. Tribute is a movie based on a Broadway play about a Broadway press agent, and so, of course, it has a lot of show business traditions in it. For example, the hero's personal show must go on even though he's dying of cancer. The press agent is played by Jack Lemmon. It's one of those roles Lemmon does so well, playing it with a combination of wives, cracks, and bravado, smiling on the outside and hurting on the inside. In this scene, Lemmon and his ex-wife, played by Lee Remick, Greet their son when he comes home from college. What the hell do you mean? You're only going to be here a week? That's okay with you. Okay with me? Well, I just wish you'd consulted me. I would have, but... Well, I knew it wouldn't make much difference to you one way or the other. You know, we always did kid around a lot, but I would like to ask one serious question. Who's his father? That was Robbie Benson as the awkward, resentful kid. He and his father have never gotten along very well. Lemon has been the kind of dad who has friends all over town, but none in his own home. He hasn't even seen his son in two years. But now that Lemon knows he has a fatal disease, he wants to get to know the kid, and that means painfully tearing down a lot of long-standing personal barriers. Let's just say that I am not the father that you always wanted. All right. Has it occurred to you that you are not the son that I always wanted. Hmm? Tribute moves on from the sort of overwrought father-son confrontation that you see in a scene like that and shows us how people have to take risks, have to let their barriers down. They have to have the courage to say what they really mean instead of allowing their lives to drift off into cheerful banality. Those are all challenges that Jack Lemmon eventually does face and meet in this movie, and Tribute is a strong, good film about human relationships. Well, it's a nice subject, father-son relationships, and I hate to pick on it, but I have to, because for me, the film never really got beyond just the recitation of lines. It's a stage play first, Jack Lemmon played in it, and like a lot of films that we've talked about that have come from plays, I found that this was just people saying words. I never bought the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Lemmon is a better actor than I think Robbie Benson, so naturally, I like Lemon's performance more, but I really just never, it never got beyond the stage to me of two people just saying confrontation lines. I think this is the sort of movie that you either go with or don't go with mm. within the first 10 minutes, and I did go with it. I felt, I think that you're right in saying that, it's, that some of the lines sound kind of stagey and written, mm -hmm. 
But I think that's part of the method of this film, especially at the beginning. This is a press agent who has been all show business and glitter for the last 30 years. This is the way he talks mm -hmm. and thinks. Mm -hmm. He's always on. He's always doing one-liners and material. And part of what the movie is about is the way that he finally has to give up that performance mm -hmm. and just face this kid and uh, talk to him as a father. Okay, but I knew that it was about a press agent, too, and I knew he was that showboat character. The part that I'm focusing in on is father-son relationships and whether mm -hmm. we buy this as an accurate one. And I'm thinking of movies like I Never Sang for My Father, mm -hmm. Great Santini, father-son relationships, mm -hmm. even ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And there was an electricity in those three films that I find totally absent here. And here it's because I think the reciting lines. So we disagree, okay? I very much disagree with okay. you about that. Porky's is one of those films that illustrates the rule, you'll never go broke underestimating the taste of the American public. You see, Porky's is the idiotic high school sex comedy that has been a box office smash in so many of the cities where it has played. How dumb is it? Try this opening scene, where a bunch of 25-year-old actors with receding <laughs> hairlines try to <laughs> convince us they are high school students in Florida <laughs> pulling a joke on their wimpy classmates. Okay, okay. Now listen. The one in your left hand is the rock, okay? That's the one you drop. The one in your right hand, that's the hard boiled egg. That's the one you hit him with. Left hand raw, right hand smack him. Go get him, Tiger. Hi, me. Hey, Peter, what's going on? Oh, nothing. Guys? Hi, hey, Watch it, man. Jeez, you know, what, he was psycho? What's with the eggs? What eggs? Those eggs. These eggs? Watch my lips. Those eggs. These eggs? Was there an echo here? <laughs> well, they're for you. For me, what am I going to do with them? Well, uh, we thought you'd like to wear one today. Morris, <laughs> <laughs> you're dead. I know. <laughs> Big surprise. Later in the film, they play another joke on that same little guy by taking him to a phony brothel in the Everglades and then chasing him out of the place just after he's taken his clothes off. Pee Wee Morris. Basketball player? Your friend of Mickey's, my brother. Well, what should we do? Pull them out. Okay, pull over. Okay, let me see your driver's license. Sort of a bad cross between the cannonball run and American graffiti. <laughs> I suppose we could have just tossed off this film as just the dog of the week. But because of its financial success, Porky's, I think, deserves a little more serious att attention. What does this movie consist of? Racist jokes, jokes about fat people, men peering through holes in walls at women taking showers, exploding prophylactics, and guys knocking off bullies, including a guy named Porky, who operates a raunchy bar. That may be an all-American lineup, but this film is excruciating to sit through because the jokes are so predictable, so drawn out, and in many cases, so leering and offensive. I must say, I didn't laugh once at Porky's. I also don't recommend the movie, but I did laugh more than you did. I think there are probably three or four good laughs in this movie. I think what it doesn't have, though, is that anarchic comic spark that humor has to have if it's going to get away with, with bad taste. Okay. You look at movies like Animal House or some of Mel Brooks's films, they deal with material that is just as much in bad taste or vulgar as anything in Porky's, but they redeem it because they're funny. And here it just falls flat and we're embarrassed half the Isn't time. it because it drags out? I mean, you could see that shot of them delivering the kid to the drive-in. Yeah. It just yeah. runs on and on. The pacing here is real slow. The whole egg joke. He should have just turned around and done it instead of walking over, setting it up, talking about it, the double take, the slow burn. See, because our mind is much faster mm -hmm. than the director's. The thing <laughs> that makes comedy funny is when the comedian is able to think faster than we are. Many times. All right. Right. But first, Roger begins with a film we've all been looking forward to, <laughs> Porky's 2, the next day. I was looking forward to seeing it 10 years from now. Porky's <laughs> 2 is a continuation of last summer's enormous box office hit named Porky's, and it features the same crowd of immature teenagers in a new series of practical jokes involving sex, crummy teachers, and square adults. Now, here's a scene that I think pretty well captures the spirit of this terrible movie. You guys are just jealous because I ruined Wendy for everybody else. Oh, no. <laughs> well, now that she's had me, what's wrong? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's not what she told me. Well, what did she tell you? Ask her, King, here she comes. Yeah, I can hear her patting from here. Look, man, when they've been had by Pee Wee Morris, they stay had. I mean, they can't keep their hands off me. And you guys better watch out because when she sees me, you're liable to get caught in the stampede. Watch this. Hi, boys. 
a cheese and a frenzy oh, feeling. Oh, she's rabid. She didn't see me. She didn't know I was here. That's what she said about you last night on the bus. Oh, man, the girl's my slave. That kind of an attitude toward women absolutely makes me cringe. It makes my skin crawl. The whole movie were like that, it'd be bad. But unfortunately, this whole movie is worse than that scene. Maybe the filmmakers were self-conscious about the attacks that critics made on their bubble brain subject matter in the last movie. Because anyway, this time there's a ridiculous and distasteful plot that makes fun of revival preachers, racists, and the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. This movie hasn't earned the right to wrap itself around those issues and to take those noble attitudes when it has such a smarmy attitude of its own. The movie ends in a big scene where hundreds of Indians watch while a bunch of clanners have their heads shaved and then are forced to walk nude into a revival meeting. That scene is pretty sick, but meanwhile, a local girl is embarrassing a crooked politician by pretending to vomit into a fountain at a restaurant while really what she's doing is squeezing put split pea soup mm -hmm. into the fountain out of her falsies. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm only providing these details in the first place, so you know what I mean when I say that this movie is completely beneath contempt. There is nothing mm -hmm. that this movie won't stoop to to get a joke. I think just reading the synopsis is enough to tell you. I mean, when you talk about scenes like that, it's pretty bad. And I really don't like the aspect that you m mentioned, first of all, which is the business with the clan. Mm -hmm. They show the clan. How do they show the clan? They beat up an Indian boy. How do they beat him up? Just a little black eye. Com comic buffoons. They don't show what the clan does, which is kill people, hang people. <laughs> This is comedy clan. This is from Archie Bunker's house. This is really, that's sick to do with something like that. And then the whole deal with what they do with the clan when they shave their heads using some perversion of a Jewish ritual. Right. It's, you know what's sick about it? It's anti-Semitism mm -hmm. masquerading as anti-racism. I know what it's you're saying. It's sick underneath the sickness. This movie mm -hmm. is corrupt from one end to the other. We didn't like this picture. It's very funny. A Christmas Story is based on the writings of American humorist Gene Shepard, recalling with great accuracy the pains and joys of his growing up in the Midwest in the 40s. The film is a collection of incidents told with an adult narrator looking back on his youth with a smile. For example, a Christmas wish for a BB rifle. What would you like for Christmas? Horrified. I heard myself blurted out. I want an official Red Rider Cup in action to enter your wings while errant. Ooh. No. Shoot your eye out. Oh, no. It was the classic mother BB gun block. <laughs> You'll shoot your eye out. Now, one of the funniest scenes in the movie is when little Ralphie visits Santa Claus at a department store and asks for the same rifle. Oh, come on up there. Oh! How about a nice uh, football? 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 What's a football? <laughs> With unconscious will, my voice squeaked out. Football. Okay, get him out of here. A football? Oh, no! Hey, what was I doing? Wake up, stupid! Wake up! No! <laughs> You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. You know, we have seen so many movies lately about people trying to do great things, you know, fly to another planet, save the world. Here is something with just as much tension, and mm -hmm. it's about a kid mm -hmm. wanting a little BB rifle. It's a sweet movie. And what's great about this movie is that even if that never happened to you, you know that that's a true scene. We remember that emotion from somewhere in our youth. A Christmas Story is full of wonderful scenes like those. It's a fragile movie, no sex, no violence. I really wonder if anyone is going to see it. I sure hope they do. I'll tell you, my guess is either nobody will go to see it or millions of people will go to see it because it will catch on. It's the kind of movie that everyone could identify with. And from those clips, we might have given the impression that it's sort of a Norman Rockwell movie. But mm -hmm. in a way, this is Norman Rockwell is filtered through the pages of Mad Magazine or the mm -hmm. National Lampoon because Gene Shepard has an edge to him. Yes, he does. And in this material, he's kind of satirical and he kind of remembers the bite and even the violence of being a kid and, and thinking about things so passionately that there's just no room for compromise. Uh, it's a wonderful film, and it was directed by, of all people, Bob Clark, who made two <laughs> of the films that you and I hate the most, Porky's One and Porky's Two. We like what he's remembering this time about his youth. Way to go, Bob. Our next movie is a comedy called Rhinestone that stars Dolly Parton and Sylvester Stallone in a story that I think was probably lifted straight out of My Fair Lady. This time, Dolly Parton plays the Professor Henry Higgins role. Stallone is Eliza Doolittle, and the deal is, if Dolly can teach Sly how to walk, talk, and sing like a country boy, she'll win her bet with the owner of a New York nightclub. Now, remember how Professor Higgins discovered Eliza as a cockney flower girl? In this scene, Dolly has just gotten Stallone fired from his job as a taxi driver. 
I kind of think you this reject from Hee Haw, so why don't you just take off because the hay wagon is leaving, all right? You can always get another job, you know. What are you, a guidance counselor? I like this job. There's a lot of memories here. Hey, hey, hey. Bad memories. Stolen has nothing to lose, though, and so he says he'll go along with her bed, and Dolly takes him back home to Tennessee so that he can do advanced research on authentic country lifestyles. Here's the scene where they get off the bus and meet some of the local good old boys. Mercy, don't you look sad. Oh, thank you, Daddy. I want you to meet somebody. This here's Nick. Howdy. What's he doing? Well, he's trying to say howdy, Daddy. Oh, well, howdy. Howdy. Hey, come on. How you doing? I'm good. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. Well, 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 I can't wait to get to the house. Well, would you get the bags, Nick? <laughs> Excuse me. I'm done? Thank you. Bags, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, slow witted, ain't he? Oh, he'll be all right, Daddy. That's Richard Farnsworth as Dolly's father, and you can almost predict the rest of this movie. Sly learns to sing country, and he falls in love with Dolly, although their love affair in this movie is so chaste and so innocent, you could play their sex scene at a Sunday school picnic. Mm -hmm. They almost seem afraid to touch each other in this movie, and that's where the trouble comes in. It doesn't feel like two flesh and blood characters are involved here. It feels more like a summit meeting between two of the great movie superpowers. The movie protects the loans and Parton's images so carefully that it never takes chances and it never really takes off. I didn't like it either, and I'll give you another reason why there aren't two mm -hmm. characters up there. Two characters weren't written in this script. Dolly Parton isn't playing anything differently than if she appeared on somebody's variety show. She walks in, she's Dolly Parton, but she doesn't play it above it, smarter or stupider than she is, mm -hmm. so there's nothing special there. Stallone, He's a little bit of a cab driver in the scene there we saw by the locker, but then after that, he's just sort of a wild man through the film, and also he seems above this material, mm -hmm. sort of wisecracking at all of it, all that's going on. So there aren't two characters out there. We come, we want to see these people engage each other. We don't have two characters. When I heard the premise for the movie, I thought it was a good premise. First of all, the story has worked for everybody from George Bernard Shaw yeah. straight through to Lerner and Lowe. That's yeah. a good story, but also make her a country singer. Make him a cab driver. Write him some lines. Give him a life that makes you think he's a New Yorker. He's not a New Yorker in this movie. Sometimes he's actually acting goofy other times he's acting strange he doesn't seem to really be a street smart guy and so the entire movie seems to be in every scene what can we think of in this scene that would be cute to do it's really a disappointment my old test on these things is would it be more interesting to watch these two actors have lunch offset and listen to their <laughs> conversation than watch them in a movie like this mm -hmm. lunch would have been more interesting too bad what i want to know is <laughs> why don't they let dolly parton play a human being in the movies Rhinestone, her new movie, treats Dolly like some sort of exhibit in the Smithsonian. Bring her on, label her, let her look good, but don't let her be spontaneous or act human. Now, just because Dolly Parton is bigger than life doesn't mean you have to treat her like she was on permanent display. She's one of the most cheerfully down-to-earth performers and one of the best country singers in show business these days, but the only movie where she really got to show that that was the real her was in the first one, 9 to 5, in 1980. She played an office worker who got fed up with all the passes that her boss was making at her. And now, in Rhinestone, her dialogue sounds like a cross between I Love Lucy and the Beverly Hillbillies. I wouldn't come to your place with a quart of Lysol and a fumigation truck. Oh, 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 oh. Now, I wonder if Dolly's amazing figure intimidates Hollywood. In Rhinestone, half the time they're shooting her from the neck up, but Dolly Parton is more than just another pretty face. I think the trick is, maybe they got to decide whether they think she can act or not. Mm -hmm. I think she can act. I do, too. We saw her act in 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. She's not that secretary, mm -hmm. but she stood for generic secretaries always getting beat up by sure. the boss. Mm -hmm. It was a very genuine character. Mm -hmm. She has not had a real character to play since. I think someone would be very smart if they do with her, just like they did with Cher. Play her, have her, uh, she, she could have played the role in Silkwood, frankly. Of course. You put her in a dress, cover her up a little bit, mm -hmm. so maybe she isn't so startling, <laughs> and let her play a down-home character. I think she can do it. I think she can, too. I think she ought to make a serious little dramatic yes. movie. And another thing she ought to make is a real musical where she gets to sing. I've got all of her records at home. Mm -hmm. I don't need, with all due respect, Sylvester Stallone and Burt Reynolds to do duets with Bob Dolly Parton in right. order to be able to hear her do country music. Yeah, she doesn't do a lot of country music in Rhinestone. Her next film, Turk 182, is embarrassingly bad. A laughably improbable story of a young man whose firefighter brother is wronged by the city of New York, so he goes on a rampage to embarrass the mayor of New York, and we're supposed to root for him. Well, this film is so stupid, I ended up rooting for the mayor. <laughs> Timothy Hutton, normally a serious young actor with good taste in movies, plays the put-upon young man who has seen his brother rescue a little girl in a fire and get injured. But when Hutton files for a claim for hospital damages for his brother, the city finds out that his brother's been 
drinking before he saved the kid. That's against fire department regulations. So they won't pay him a cent. And that leads to Timothy Hutton confronting no less than the mayor of New York at an impromptu press conference. You well, that's come, you what? come waltzing in here with a sob story about a drunk? Yeah. Wait a minute, he ain't no drunk. My brother right. is not a drunk. Right. You go home, and you take a shower, and you comb your hair, and you think about it. Let him go. Now, no mayor is going to act like that much of a jerk. I mean, it's just totally improbable, that scene. So right away, we don't believe this movie. But that's the premise that starts Timothy Hutton playing pranks on the mayor, interrupting his every public function by writing his brother's nickname and firefighter's badge number, Turk, that's his nickname, 182, that's his brother's badge mm -hmm. number, on subway cars and even on the Queensboro Bridge. Tom, Jimmy Lynch is 260 feet in the air. <laughs> Clearly, he is fashioning the most... They're somewhat hampered in their attempts to reach Lynch because apparently Jimmy Lynch has greased all of the lower girders. <laughs> Oh, sure, he's had plenty of time to grease all of the girders because they've only been guarding the place all day long. It's late in the movie. They know what's going to happen. Uh, and he's sure he's going to walk in with all these vats of grease. Not to mention his, enti his entire steeplejack uniform that he managed to attach <laughs> unobtrusively to the top of the bridge. That's a preposterous scene, one of many in this film. And if you see this picture, you're going to spot an obvious gaping flaw in this film because for at least three quarters of the movie, no one in the city of New York, this is the guts of the movie, no one can figure out who this mysterious guy is that's riding Turk 182 on subway cars and all that. No one knows who it is. Not even, and here's the flaw, Timothy Hutton's own brother, who's in the hospital, his nickname is Turk, and his badge number on his firefighter's helmet is 182. He wasn't injured that badly that he can't remember his nickname. And when I saw that mistake, I was in the theater, I was going to jump up and say, look at what the mistake this movie's making. Let's raid this film. Let's tear the screen apart. I gave up on the script at that moment because it isn't really trying to make sense. This film really infuriated me. I think you're right, Gene, and I think this movie takes a whole new meaning to the word the idiot plot. You know, this oh, whole yeah. we've had about movies that would end instantly if there were anyone in the movie who wasn't an idiot who could say, well, look, it's all obvious, and I've solved it, it's and the movie end is in over. In one minute, as soon as they realize that all these, once he gets to the mayor of New York, uh -huh. the mayor of New York is going to say, yeah, this guy was wrong. We'll look into it, and here we'll so settle the claim. The mayor wouldn't. So it's over. The mayor wouldn't do what he does in the movie. The guy wouldn't be able to do what he does End now. In movies like this, if we can become sympathetic with the character and be carried along with him, that can be a lot of fun. But nothing infuriates me more than a movie that wants my sympathy while insulting my intelligence. Yeah. Well, this does constantly, and I'm telling you, this film is going to be on my worst ten of the year. No matter what happens, it's okay, going to be real it, high up. Engrave it right Turk 182. I'm going to write it in my mind. I'll next never forget it. Our next film is called Loose Cannons. And following on the success of the Lethal Weapon movies, it's yet another cop buddy picture with a mixed pair of detectives. Gene Hackman plays the veteran cop. Dan Aykroyd plays a literal nutcase, shell-shocked by violence. He's got a brilliant investigative mind, but he spent the last two years in a mental hospital. Then, two men chased the fat man dressed as the Queen of Hearts, but he got away. They're assigned to solve some murders involving the pursuit of a rare Nazi film purporting to be a porno film involving Adolf Hitler. That's sort of distasteful. The trail takes them to a bar where the incipient violence causes Aykroyd to freak out with movie imitations. You've got to ask yourself one question. You feel lucky, punk. Do you? Do you? Yes, another hackneyed bar fight. Along for the ride in pursuit of the killers is Dom DeLuise playing a porno king. Hackman's upset because Aykroyd is destroying Hackman's classic woody car. What are you doing to my car? Welcome to the NASCAR driving school. Anybody can learn to drive a stock car with our patented technique of teaching. This is an amazingly bad film. The boys also run across an Israeli secret agent, Nancy Travis, who also wants the Nazi film. Not too witty dialogue here. Attaché, Israeli embassy. Attaché, spelled Mossad. Mossad. Israeli Secret Service. Oh, that's my people. I'd like to apply for political asylum right now. This is truly ludicrous. Hackman isn't given a distinctive character. Aykroyd's character makes the film a farce, which undercuts the thriller aspect. The case that they're on is absurd. I didn't find anything to like about Loose Cannons, and I'm very surprised to find Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd in this, oh, with it, this script. It's a complete dismal mess. Now, come on now. Isn't Stanley and Iris looking better and better as the show goes on? That is not a compliment to Stanley and Iris no, to compare it to Loose Cannons. I've got to admit. Now, this movie is a complete 
mess. And it's got all kinds, for example, why is a bar in a cop movie? To have a fight. To have a fight in. Why is Dom DeLuise in a cop movie? In order to play Dom DeLuise, that's right. one of the real weak points in this film, is that Dom DeLuise is always playing himself so that you can never believe that he's the character, and so therefore it's like a guest star kind of role. It's like television, you know, where somebody comes in and says, hi, I'm Dom DeLuise, and then everybody right. knows it, but they don't say it because they pretend that he's somebody else. As for the Aykroyd characterization, where he's doing Tweety Pie and Sylvester and Pee Wee Herman and uh, all of these other things, that is completely off-putting. It's like some kind of a vaudeville act that's shoved into the movie every five minutes you for know, no purpose. I was thinking about that. You know why they write characters like that? Because, think about it, these are movie industry writers, okay? So mm -hmm. what do they know? They know movies and they know TV, because that's what they grew up on. Mm -hmm. And so, in an, you know, in an urban setting, in a cop thing, they put in that character trait. Mm -hmm. It's totally inappropriate. Now it's just a, it's just what they know about. There's another thing about this movie. This porno movie that allegedly stars Hitler shows him, allegedly, yes. Uh, yes. in compromising circumstances with a politician who is now going to be the next chancellor of West Germany, unless this film, of course, is shown, in which case right. his prospects would probably be dimmed. Now, one of the things that bothers me is that to this day, it's absolutely routine in the movies for today's Germans to be dismissed as a bunch of neo-Nazis. You know, and there's the convention that the Nazis are really still behind Germany. I can't think of any other ethnic group or any other nationality group that is so routinely slandered in respectable circles with no protest. Oh, I think that there are plenty of other groups that get it. The Arabs get it all the time. Uh, people from the Middle East in terms of uh, uh, terrorists, I think they're probably the easiest ones. Uh, I just saw a film uh, set in Mexico where all the Mexicans are fat, slop, basically fat, sloppy, vulgar, beer drink. I mean, the movies, when they deal with any ethnic group, tend to deal in broad stereotypes. Mm -hmm.